um, an amazing fireside chat lined up for you. Please uh, join me in welcoming the CEO of Kabam, Kevin Chu. And with him, Douglas McMillan from Bloomberg News. Thank you. Great, welcome. Hello, hi, thanks for joining us. I'm very excited to uh, welcome Kevin Chu, the CEO of social gaming company Kabam. Um, you know, in a year when, when Zynga, the social gaming leader, has had some struggles, Kabam has expanded. Um, the company is on track to do more than $150 million in revenue this year. Um, its hit game, Kingdoms of Camelot, is one of the highest grossing games in the iPhone app store this year. And uh, a company that started on Facebook, mostly Facebook social gaming, has over the past year migrated to mobile and other platforms very successfully. Now just under 30% of the company is actually on Facebook. The rest is on other platforms. Um, so Kevin, I'd like to start off. You, you went into social gaming uh, in about 2009. Um, what was your vision? What opportunity did you see in social gaming? Sure, so 2009 was the beginning of uh, free-to-play games in the Western market, specifically America. And I was really excited about the promise of a better consumer experience where consumers can start, where players can start playing a game for free and see if they like it or not, and then pay into it uh, as they, after they get value out of you know, playing a game and after they, they're entertained. Um, and so it kind of flipped the model on its head. It was not so much, you know, I watch a, a sexy commercial about how, how great the new Call of Duty is, and then I go out and I pay $60, and I hope I really like what I get. Now it's kind of flips the model around. You can, through a PC back then, through a browser, you can access these games on Facebook and start playing them for free within a few seconds of seeing it. See which one of these games your friends are playing, join them in playing it. Um, and then pay afterwards, pay as you go along. And this is a very common <clears throat> widespread model now. Back in 2009, it was relatively new for this market. That's right, that's right. And that's still considered to be relatively new. And especially the, what we first started in 2009, um, we focused on what we thought of as core gamers. So people who are game enthusiasts that own console games, or consoles, uh, play console games and PC games. We really wanted to make a very different type of experience than the casual games that were really dominating so, Facebook. So let's then. talk about that. The, the, the typical Zynga uh, customer, Zynga player, um, is not a, an avid, hardcore gamer. They weren't playing the Xboxes and Playstations before. Your, your customers are. Your users are. Can you tell us about who is playing Kabam games these days? Sure. So generally, we have a pretty broad target because we, um, make our game, we try to make our games as accessible as possible across as many different devices. And so we look for consumers, generally speaking, who are a little bit more male skewing. About 60% of our audience is males. And they're between the ages of, of 18 to 55. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's different? When, you, when you're thinking about this audience and uh, creating a game for them, how do you develop for that specific audience? Sure. So I think when we think about gaming, it's a, it's a combination of art and science. And so it has to start with the creative aspect first. And in 2009, we were thinking about what could we do within a browser. And you know, back then, uh, Flash gaming was really just starting. Flash and using Flash for making games was just starting to um, you know, become a little bit more mature from a technology standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so we were thinking about what kind of a game could we create with the technology limitations we had back then. And so we really focused on strategy games and empire building games um, as the first game that we came out with, which became Kingdoms of Camelot. And uh, so Kingdoms of Camelot doesn't have a whole lot of fancy uh, animations or high fidelity battle scenes and things like that. But we really focused on creating a really strong, engaging gameplay. And we made it very competitive. We made it uh, an experience that you could play for two to three hours at a time, as opposed to the casual games, which you really felt like you were sort of barred or prohibited from going any further in the game after playing about 15 minutes because you would run out of the energy um, that became run out of energy, which became one of the kind of widespread um, game mechanics that the casual gaming companies. And does it cost a little bit more to invest in these games and develop these kind of more robust games? That's right. So it it it, uh, it, it costs more to develop these from a. Um, uh, you know, from an R&D perspective, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think one of the things that probably drives up gameplay, game development costs more than anything else, is uh, the fidelity of the game 
experience. And so going into 3D, for example, is moving up uh, development cross costs across the board. Mm -hmm. And as we go into mobile, specifically tablets as well as smartphones, with the power, the com the the processing power and the graphics processing power of these uh, new devices, we we can really create much higher fidelity games. So that will drive up costs a little bit more. But the whole point is that these games, Kings of Camelot, has now run for three full years, and we have a larger team working on that game than what we did when we launched that game. Mm -hmm. And so we're constantly producing new content, new features. Uh, new events in these games, and they, they can be. A, we basically spread out the total development costs over a much longer period of time, and we basically match the revenues with the costs mm -hmm. over time. So it's a much more efficient model. Let's let's talk about mobile because this is increasingly the battleground for social gaming. Uh, we've seen, you know, one of the one of the early social gaming companies, Crowdstar, has shifted completely to mobile. Um, we've seen Zynga over the past year. Uh, really have some struggles in mobile and talk about very publicly about how they are shifting a lot of their emphasis towards mobile. What's your mobile strategy and how's it going so far? Sure, so we, we launched, we started developing mobile games last year and we launched our very first mobile game in the spring of, of this year. So it's only been about seven months since our first mobile game came to market and we've just been blown away by some of the things that we see on mobile. So some of the things that I think <clears throat> happen on mobile is that people have these devices with them all the time. And, and so the retention rates uh, across games are generally speaking much better than what we would see on, on the web. And then secondarily, because of uh, the way that consumers are putting their credit cards into iTunes and more and more consumers are using Google Wallet and feeling conf uh, using Google Wallet for a number of things um, and are using that as a payment option, it's, a, it's easier to get consumers to, to pay for uh, virtual goods within mm. games, so, so that's been very exciting. So you see both kind of a retention lift as well as a mon monetization uh, ease of purchase on mobile. I don't think everyone's saying this yet. You're seeing a higher uh, ARPU for revenue per user on mobile than you are on Facebook? We haven't said that specifically, but okay. we, we are saying that we're, we're very excited about some of the things that we're, we're seeing. So uh, what we have said is that conversion rates on mobile tend to be better than what we see on the web. Okay. Um, going back to, to Facebook, where you guys started, um, the, you know, comparis in comparison to mobile, uh, a lot of folks in the industry are saying that there are some challenges in Facebook that maybe uh, the growth is slowing down significantly in mobile. Maybe maybe this this is a satu or, sorry in Facebook. Maybe this is a saturated market. Facebook. What, where do you see uh, Facebook and social gaming going forward? And what do you think? Facebook needs to do to keep this a healthy, viable market? Sure, so this is a very deep topic. I'd love to talk um, about this. I think, I think Facebook, if you take a look at Facebook's business in Q2 of this year, they reported $192 million of Facebook credits revenue. If you kind of back that out, they're taking 30% of the transaction. So that means about a $2.5 billion market on Facebook as a platform for games. Um, which is the primary driver of revenues. Now, that only happens on the web. They do not take any Facebook credits revenue uh, on mobile. And when Facebook talks about their numbers, you can now see that their total DAU count is higher on mobile than it is on the web, mm -hmm. and yet they're making no credits revenue on mobile. And one of the reasons why you know, they're having, you know, from, a, from a broad macro level, is that Apple and Google control the app stores and the payment mechanisms on their um, on their hardware and, and platforms. And so Facebook can't, right now there's no, no gaming company is paying Facebook credits revenue on mobile. Mm -hmm. And so. Because you'd have to charge two taxes. You'd have to charge 30% to Facebook and 30% to Apple. That's right, that's right. So Facebook doesn't really try to do that yet. Facebook is still struggling overall to figure out how to monetize mobile. And they're really starting to focus on advertising uh, and creating a really powerful ad network that takes all the information that they know about consumers and helps them find applications. So that's being successful, but they don't have a way yet to be successful making credits revenue on mobile. We'd love, I think the whole ecosystem would love more ways, more platform developers, that, more platforms, I should say, to enable app developers to be successful on mobile. Mm -hmm. So today it's really, that world is being dominated by Apple. Google is becoming uh, a, a very viable platform for, for app developers. Amazon is starting to enter with um, their second generation of Kindle uh, mm -hmm. 
for app, app developers. So all of that's very exciting, but Facebook is really blocked from being in the mobile application platform business today. And I think they, um, so that's kind of one of the challenges that they face. And as an app developer, when we, as a game developer, when we first started our life, we started with 100% of our business on Facebook. And then we looked around and said, you know what, more and more consumers are starting to play games on their phones and their tablets, and we need to make sure that our products work on those things, and we can't reach those consumers through Facebook itself. Sure. And so we started that, um, that diversification about 18 months ago, and today, more than any other gaming company, we've really broadened our, our uh, diversity of platforms and our revenues, as you, as you noted, over 70% of our revenues today are off of Facebook, which is tremendous given that just 18 months ago, 100% of our revenues mm -hmm. We're on mm -hmm. Facebook. One move Facebook has made recently, and uh, Zuck Mark Zuckerberg was pretty public about this in his appearance uh, uh, a month ago, is that they have moved away from HTML5, a technology that Facebook was very public about betting on and saying this is the future, you know, earlier this year even, um, about HTML5, has moved, Facebook has moved back towards the direction of native, and they've redone their mobile app. Um, all native and backed away from HTML5. What do you see uh, the difference between HTML5 and native going forward? Is HTML5 a uh, technology that, that game makers should not bet on anymore? Sure, so let, let me talk about, there's two different parts of this topic of H, HTML5 versus native. The first is from a game developer standpoint. If you're a game developer, there's no doubt that native applications is the right way to go to market today. So you just, the performance that you can get from HTML5 in terms of making a, a, a game is just not appropriate today for, for making a game. Even the casual game developers are really moving away from HTML5. Mm -hmm. And certainly if you're looking to create uh, a higher fidelity experience, um, HTML, there, there's really no, no game developer doing, um, doing that in HTML5. So, so that, that's from a game development standpoint. Definitely native or some of the cross-platform uh, uh, technologies that are coming to market, Unity and a few others, are, uh, are, are great platforms to develop native, uh, great tool sets to develop native applications on. Mm -hmm. Now, from Facebook's standpoint, they offer very, they're not, they're not in the business of making games. They're making a, a, a platform service for, uh, for consumers. And I think, um, you know, f as a game developer, I would have loved for, whether it's Facebook or some other big internet company, to really push HTML5 development forward and open up browser-based usage of the mobile internet. So that would allow game developers to eventually reach consumers more directly over time and not be totally uh, constrained to going through Apple or Google's app stores to get our games distributed to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And as we just talked about with Facebook's you know, tax, um, if, as they are an application developer themselves, if they were to try to get into the mobile, publishing, mobile game publishing business, um, they, would, they would have to pay a 30%, we'd, you know, they'd have to figure out how to take a tax on top of either Apple or Google's tax. Right. But if they could really pr push forward the mobile web, then they can really start becoming more of a, a platform for uh, you know, being a gateway to, to games, much like they did with uh, their Canvas on right on the broader internet. Who do you, on, uh, back to the kind of mobile platforms, uh, who do you see as being the number three mobile platform in the next few years? You got, you got Apple and, and Google. Who's gonna emerge as the number three player here? Sure, so I think uh, my guess would be Amazon. So they, there's a lot of excitement uh, from app developers around Amazon. Uh, some of that has been more tempered in the recent past. Some of the game companies have said, Amazon's great, you can make a lot more revenue per user on Amazon because of the great payment uh, you know, methods that Amazon has pioneered, as well as the confidence in Amazon as a system, uh, but the numbers are small. And so the original Kindle that started selling, um, uh, the Kindle Fire, I should say, that started selling last Christmas, yeah, there's a relatively smaller install base there. But I think this, this Christmas season, you're gonna see a lot more Kindle Fires in the marketplace, which makes it a lot more interesting for app developers. Do you have any titles for Kindle Fire? Not yet in the market. Okay, can we look for that sometime soon? Probably. <laughs> um, we're almost in 2013. Next year, what is going to separate the winners from the losers in social gaming in 2013? So in 2013, I think um, you know, the market is going to be into, into, enter into a, a, a more competitive 
uh, kind of phase in its life cycle. A little bit like what we saw in Facebook, probably starting in 2010, uh, early 2011. So what's already starting to happen is that customer acquisition rates are going up. Uh, so it's harder to uh, buy media for uh, and, and basically pay for customers and get them into a game experience. And so you really have to focus on um, understanding how to reach consumers, whether it be through uh, pay to customer acquisition or community building or, or you know, social features within your game. Um, so that's going to become a little bit more important. Uh, second, so understanding distribution and marketing. The second thing is that, that's going to become more important is the fidelity of these games are going up. There's going to be more genres of games. So really in the last four-ish years on smartphones and mobile, simulation games have kind of dominated or very more simplistic kind of game mechanics, a little bit like what we saw on Facebook back in sort of 2009. Um, and these days, I think there's going to be, going into 2013, there's going to be more parity from Facebook to mobile in terms of the fidelity of games uh, the complexity and sophistication of uh, the content mm -hmm. uh, and game mechanics that are being mm -hmm. built. Uh, so we have, uh, I understand we have a number of um, developers in the audience. Um, do you have any advice for young developers getting into the space in social gaming? I think there's a humongous amount of opportunity. The, the growth of smartphones uh, continues unabated, uh, both in developed markets as well as emerging markets. And so I think for if you're an um, a app developer today looking to get into the market, there's so many different opportunities. And I think it's instead of trying to serve everyone in the marketplace, because the marketplace is very, very big, really think about a target audience that you want to serve and think about serving that audience really well. And some of the areas I would probably point out is uh, some international markets are, are really, really interesting, and there's not a whole lot of um, you know, game developers focused on other markets outside of you know, Western, outside of the Western, key Western developed markets, and so there's a lot of opportunities in emerging markets. Um, and there's opportunities in new genres of games that really haven't been um, as successful before, but now that there is uh, just this large number of, of people and rapidly growing people, you can make more niche type of uh, game experiences and uh, find that audience and really serve that audience well. Great. Great. Kevin, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank thank you. you for everyone for joining us.